So if you saw our last video, we talked about what Calvinism is and why it is accepted by so many Christians, what, what the appeal to it is, how it's a logically coherent system, and how many, many faithful, godly, amazing Christians, Christian leaders, pastors, teachers, authors, people in church history, it's had wide appeal. But the question that we're going to look at in this video is, is it the only way to look at scripture? Is Calvinism the gospel, or is it merely one way of interpreting the gospel? And is there a better approach to scripture than what Calvinism has to offer? So here's part two of this series where I present what I think overall does more justice to the totality of what we find in scripture than traditional Calvinism, or for that matter, traditional Arminianism. So whether you're a Calvinist, an Arminian, or something in between, here's a discussion that I hope will challenge and push and encourage you in your thinking about all of these issues. Calvinists aren't the only ones that have a tulip. There's a tulip of non-Calvinism, and I know because I made it up last night. Um, <laughs> Uh, there are non-Calvinist ways to look at these same passages and these same doctrines. And, and what they are is total captivity, union with the elect Messiah, longing God, integrity of the offer, and present assurance. Now, total captivity. Rather than saying humanity is born into a state of fallenness that means that you can't even choose to do good if you wanted to because your will is entirely affected by sin, what you see in Scripture can also allow, and I, I would say it does teach, that we are born into a state of captivity to sin as a master who has not just enslaved us, but has enslaved humanity and has enslaved creation, but he did it through humanity giving their authority to him when they rebelled in the garden. The authority that humanity was supposed to have, they gave over to Satan through their Eve's eating of the fruit and Adam standing right there with her and not judging the serpent, but actually partaking. And because of that, humanity gave up their place. And sin and Satan and death became the rulers and the norm. And that's why God said, in the day you eat of it, you'll surely die. That was the consequence, is giving over that authority, that God-given authority has now been given over. So when Jesus comes, he identifies Satan as the prince of this world, the ruler of this age. Um, you see Satan has, has some ability in the Bible to accuse, to come before God. He has some authority. He tempts Jesus in the wilderness by offering him all the nations of the world to bow down to him. How is that a temptation if he couldn't actually do that? If he couldn't actually make the world powers, the principalities, all of the things that he controlled, if he couldn't bend those towards serving a nationalistic, militaristic Israel's Messiah, how would that be a temptation? So Satan has this authority, has this power, but what we see in the gospel is God proclaiming that through the arrival of the Messiah, that power has been defeated on the cross. And as part of that, it means that we have been brought out of slavery through the atoning blood, just like the Israelites were brought out of Egypt through the blood of the Passover lamb covering their doorposts. And so we are no longer captives to sin. Romans chapter 6 is all about this concept. This is just verses 20 and 23, but the whole chapter spells this out. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things you are now ashamed of? Those things result in death. But now you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to God. The benefit you reap leads to holiness. The result is eternal life, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul will then go on in Romans 7 to contrast what life looked like and felt like as someone who was still living in Adam, in the flesh, non-converted, and that's the chapter of I do what I don't want to do, the things I don't want to do, I do, who will rescue me, what a wretched man I am. So you read Romans 6, you read Romans 7, you get a picture that the rescue of God was a bringing us out of captivity to a master that we were willfully serving. If God lifts us up out of the muck and the mire and our desires and shows us his beauty and then shows us the muck that we're in, he gives us a choice whether we want to go back to what's comfortable and good and fun or whether we want to go to what's even more beautiful and more better. And many people will choose to go back. The road is wide that leads to destruction. 
Narrow is the path that leads to salvation. So rather than saying it's total depravity, we're all born, and God has to regenerate us before we can even choose the good, it's rather, no, we are dead in our sins because the world is under the domain of death. And Paul is not saying by saying you're dead in your sins and your trespasses that you are incapable of any response. Because later he'll talk about Christians and say you're dead to sin. Well, I don't know any Calvinist that says, well, that means that we are unable to sin anymore. No Calvinist would say that. So we don't press that as literally if we're not going to press it literally elsewhere. Rather, what Paul's saying is, he could paraphrase, you're as good as dead in your sin. Your fate is determined while you're in sin. The wages of sin is death, and that's where you're headed on payday while you are in that state. However, if you receive the gospel, if you turn to the gospel, if you accept Jesus in faith, then God pulls you out of that and brings you through the waters of baptism, like the Red Sea, into the promised land as his people, Israel. So that's the paradigm that we're working with. So total depravity, does the Bible allow for that doctrine? Yeah, you could make some good arguments for it. Does the Bible demand that you believe that doctrine? Absolutely not, and not even close. Is it more probable that that's the correct doctrine? I don't think it is. I'm not a Calvinist, and that's part of the reason why. I have good Calvinist friends and colleagues who would disagree with me. They believe it is. I believe it's not. Scripture will allow for either, but I think it teaches against that concept of what the fall did to us. Revelation 1.5 talks about when it's introducing Jesus, grace to you, and he's opening the letter, and then he says, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve his God and Father. To him be the glory and power forever and ever. Amen. This is language from Exodus that was ascribed to Israel, the people, as they were brought out of captivity to Egypt under the rulership of Yahweh at Mount Sinai through the blood of the Passover lamb. And so the Revelation author takes this and he says, that's what we are. But it's the new covenant. So Jesus, because of his death, because of his shedding of his own blood, he has been exalted, and he now is king, ruler over all the kings of the earth. He did not need to take Satan's offer in order to experience that. He had to wait, do it God's way, and God exalted him to the highest of heavens because he humbled himself to the lowest depths, Philippians 2. So this is the view of what, a view of what Jesus has done, a way to think about salvation. The old term for this was called Christus Victor, victorious Messiah. And it was the oldest and most widespread view of what the atonement means. It's older than penal substitution. It's older than the ransom theory. Any of these type of what the atonement actually means, the oldest one and the one that was proclaimed the loudest and the most widespread was this idea of Christus Victor. Jesus has won the victory over Satan and beat Satan with his own weapon, which was the death of the Messiah. That turned out to be uh, the way that Satan was defeated, beat with his own weapon. The question is, well, what's the, why didn't the Bible flat out teach free will? You know, it seems they'll talk about predestination. Where's the verse that says we have genuine libertarian free will? And Fisher makes a good observation. He says, looking for free will in the Bible is like looking for gravity. It's assumed everywhere and holds everything together. So you probably won't notice it until it's missing and you float away. This is why it's usually easier to rattle off multiple verses that seem to contradict free will than it is to name a single verse that affirms it. We think of God hardening Pharaoh's heart because the passage sticks out. It cuts against the grain of the rest of the biblical narrative. I think he's absolutely right. Every exhortation in Scripture, every demand that God makes, every request that God makes, every teaching hortatory passage that God gives that's telling us to do something innately assumes that we will respond to it, can respond to it, and should respond to it. God doesn't need to tell people, oh, hey, you, you know that thing, your will, the thing that, that you use to choose between things? That exists. God doesn't need to spell that out because that's something that humans innately realize. Nobody has to be taught that they have the ability to make choices. The you, union with the elect Messiah, when we start talking about, and you hear people talk about election, predestination, the chosen, one thing we have to realize, that's not New Testament language. Those are Old Testament terms. Paul didn't invent it. Peter didn't invent it. Jesus didn't invent it. Election is the way the Old Testament talked about Israel. 
Israel was the elect. Israel was the chosen. Everything that the New Testament authors apply to Christians now was first applied by God to Israel. And in particular, and in Isaiah, that election, that calling, that, that choosing before the foundation of the world that God speaks over as Israel, there's some passages in Isaiah that that is applied to this mysterious figure called the servant. The servant is talked about as God's elect, as God's chosen. So in the Old Testament, the elect is the people of Israel as a whole, as a corporate entity. Isaiah 42, behold, my servant whom I uphold, mine elect in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. This is of the servant. This is of the coming Messiah. He is the elect. For Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, mine elect. I have even called thee by name. I have summoned thee, though thou hast not known me. Israel, even in their rebellion, is called God's elect. Isaiah 65, and I will bring forth a seed out of Jacob and out of Judah, an inheritor of my mountains. Mine elect shall inherit it, and my servants shall dwell there. Israel, the elect. Isaiah 44, but now listen, O Jacob, my servant Israel, whom I have chosen. This is what the Lord says, he who made you, who formed you in the womb, and will help you. Do not be afraid, O Jacob, my servant, Jerushan, which means righteous, whom I have chosen. For I will pour out water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. They will spring up like grass in a meadow, like poplar trees by flowing streams. One will say, I belong to the Lord. Another will call himself by the name of Jacob. Still another will write on his hand, the Lord's, and will take the name Israel. A radical Old Testament passage where even Gentiles are being welcomed and called into this identity of the elect and are taking the name Israel upon themselves. I. Howard Marshall, New Testament scholar, he says, examination of the usage in the Old Testament and in Judaism outside of Christianity shows that the phrase the elect is used of those who have become members of God's people and never of individuals before they have become members of God's people. You'll never read in Scripture the elect referring to anything other than people who have entered into relationship with God as a whole. C.K. Barrett, New Testament scholar, says election does not take place arbitrarily or fortuitously. It takes place always and only in Christ. They are elect who are in him, and they are elect in him. It's a failure to remember that this that causes confusion over Paul's doctrine of election and predestination. Peter says it this way, you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers. But with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect, he was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him, you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him. So your faith and hope are in God. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for your brothers, love one another deeply from the heart. The elect is Jesus because Jesus is Israel. And only insofar as we are in Jesus are we part of the elect. It was always a corporate thing. Even Romans 9, the famous Calvinist passage, Jacob I have loved, Esau I have hated. That entire section of Romans 9 is quoting Old Testament prophets who are speaking about the people of Israel as a whole and the people of Edom as a whole. And they're using the term Jacob and Esau as ciphers or shorthands for the Israelites and the Edomites. And they're discussing how God uses different peoples for different purposes in bringing about his plans in the world. And that's what Paul is doing in Romans 9. He's showing how God uses and calls and elects peoples in order to do things. There's no discussion of election in the Bible that's about an individual when it comes to salvation. There's God doing things like calling Cyrus before he was born to deliver Israel. But in terms of salvation, every time election is discussed, It's corporate, and it's always only in Jesus. So think about it this way. Everything that we have as Christians, we only have because we are united with Jesus. 
He's the recipient of all God's promises. He's the benefactor of all God's grace. He is Israel. So we only have a birthright. We only have a standing with God as we're united with Jesus. In the Old Testament, Israel as a people were called and chosen. They were the elect. There was nothing that could alter that God was going to redeem the world through Israel, his people. Nothing could change that. They were the elect. Israel would inherit salvation. Individual Israelites could come and go. People like Achan could go through disobedience. People who rose up like Korah in the rebellion against Moses would be cut off from their people. Individuals could come and go from Israel based on their covenant obedience and their faith in God. Likewise, non-Israelites could come into Israel. People like Ruth, people like Rahab. So the borders of Israel were transferable. You could choose to become part of Israel or you could choose to rebel against God. If you chose to rebel, you would be cut off. Cut off from what? The promises made to Israel. So the elect were going to receive the reward. The question for the individual Israelite was, are you going to be with them? And that was based on response to grace. So the you is not unconditional election that God just for all time and purpose decreed that he's going to elect some and damn others and that's just going to help. No, there is a choice that God allows. And if you are in Jesus, you're in the elect. You are part of the group that God predestined from all time. You're on the boat and it's going to reach the shore. The question is, can you choose to jump ship? We'll get to that in a second. Some people say, well, wait a minute, if I can choose salvation, hold on there. If I can choose salvation, that means that I chose and I enabled my own salvation and I can boast because I did something. And the response, I like Olson and Fisher both, they respond to this, being saved is not a matter of doing work. It's only a matter of not resisting. When a person decides to allow God's grace to save, he or she repents and trusts only and completely in Christ. This is a passive act. It could be compared to a drowning person who decides to relax and let his rescuer save him from drowning. Fisher says it even better. What sort of idiot receives a gift and then starts boasting about how he used the muscles in his vocal cords, tongue, and mouth to say, yes, I will accept this gift? If somebody writes me a check for $100,000 and I go deposit it in the bank, I, I can't even fathom how I could boast in any way, shape, or form for that. I did nothing to earn that gift, but I have to deposit it in the bank in order for that gift to be actualized. So I don't initiate the gift, but I do have to play a part in receiving it. There's nothing in Scripture against that, not even the passage of against boasting in Ephesians, any of that. The assumption that Calvinism brings to the table is that acceptance of salvation is a work. If you assume that agreeing with something is a work, then you got to go Calvinist if you want to be consistent. But if you question that assumption, wait, no, receiving a gift is not a work at least not in the biblical sense, then the shackles of Calvinism fall off and you, you're, oh, I don't have to believe. I, it's just an unnecessary doctrine now. It doesn't mean that it's heretical. It doesn't mean you're going to go to hell if you believe it, whatever, but it's just not necessary. So L, limited atonement? No. What I see in Scripture is a longing God, a God who gives his atonement, who stretches out his hands and makes the offer and genuinely makes the offer to everyone. He does not limit it just to the elect, to those he know will accept it because the blood of Jesus may be wasted otherwise. That's a concept that's totally foreign to Scripture itself as well. Jesus did things all the time that seemed on the surface view to be a failure. He called to people all the time to repent. People turned away. He called to people all the time, go sell all your possessions and come follow me. The man walks away. Does that mean Jesus is a failure? Where did that concept come from? Somewhere in, in, in Reformed thought. But it's not one that Scripture demands. Look at God as painted in Ezekiel 18. Let's see if this sounds like a God who is of limiting atonement. Do I take any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the sovereign Lord? Rather, am I not pleased when they turn from their ways and live? But if a righteous man turns from his righteousness and commits sin and does the same detestable things the wicked man does, will he live? None of the righteous things he's done will be remembered. Because of the unfaithfulness, he is guilty of sin, and because of the sins he has committed, he will die. Yet you say the way of the Lord is not just. Here, O house of Israel, is my way unjust? Isn't it your ways that are unjust? If a righteous man turns from his righteousness and commits sin, he'll die for it. Because of the sin he has committed, he'll die. But if a wicked man turns away from the wickedness he's committed and does what is just and right, he will save his life. Because he considers all the offenses he has committed and turns away from them, he will surely live. He will not die. Yet the house of Israel says the way of the Lord is not just. 
Are my ways unjust, O house of Israel? Is it not your ways that are unjust? Therefore, O house of Israel, I will judge you, each one according to his ways, declares the sovereign Lord. Repent. Turn away from all your offenses. Then sin will not be your downfall. Rid yourselves of all the offenses you've committed and get a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, house of Israel? For I take no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the sovereign Lord. Repent and live. Chapter 33, Ezekiel goes on to say to them, again, as surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. Why will you die, O house of Israel? God is longing for these wicked people to turn to him. There's no concept of a God who is reprobate, has decreed from all eternity that only some will and only some won't. Those who will, it's because he wills it, and those who want, it's because he ordained them in that way. That concept is a completely foreign view to passages like this that express the longing heart of God for everyone. We see it in the New Testament. Paul writes to Timothy, this is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of truth the way that Calvinists respond to this verse. They say what that means is he wants all from all people. He wants all kinds of people. He wants some from every nation to come to him, but not every single individual. And they're right. All doesn't always mean all in the Bible. All the world came to Joseph to buy grain. That doesn't mean the Inuit were paddling canoes from Greenland to buy grain. So all doesn't always mean all. But in this case and in the context, it kind of seems like that's what God's saying, is he really does want all people to return. Now, now you can't base your doctrine on one passage. That's called proof texting. And I'm not putting these up here to proof text. I'm putting these up here so you can see how Scripture talks about these things. And then you can go back and study them in their context and see if it bears out. Peter says, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. These two verses now together, okay, if one could be translated in isolation, could say God wants all kinds of people, Second Peter comes along and it makes it harder to make that case. This really does seem to say, and when you pattern it with Ezekiel, God really does seem to be offering salvation to everyone who will turn. And the offer seems to be genuine. And that brings us to the next one, the I, the integrity of the offer. If God makes an offer and you can't not accept it, that's not a genuine offer. That's, that's a pantomime. That's a, that's a play. That's acting. If God says, do this, knowing that there's no way that you can't not do that, then there's no genuineness in that command. There's no response. There's no such thing as love. And, and obviously my Calvinist friends would disagree, but I would press them on it. I'd challenge them. I'd say, no, 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 no. Love demands and requires the ability to not love in order to be genuine. Because if you can't not love someone, then you are not experiencing a relationship. There's a, a robotic, mechanistic response. When I teach on God and the problem of evil, and I came up with this analogy here during my Wesley days when I was street preaching and you have to generate a crowd out at Tate. <clears throat> and so I came up with the Playboy analogy. And the Playboy analogy is, let's say that somebody in here, you know, you, you, you're married and you look at your wife, you say, honey, I love you, I'm never going to cheat on you. But you make it while you're on a desert island and you're the only two people. So if I turn and look at my wife, my invisible, non-existent wife, and I say, honey, I love you and I'm never going to cheat on you. And we're the only two people on the island, that doesn't mean anything. Not to me, not to her. There's no ability for me to not do that. That's an empty promise. There's nothing real there. Flip it around. Let's say we're going on our honeymoon and our plane crashes and we're the only two survivors and we land in the Playboy Mansion. And for some reason, all of the bunnies and all of the party people are just super attracted to, and I don't use myself, I use somebody from the audience usually at this point as an example. I say they're all attracted to this guy, to that beard. Of course they're attracted to that. So <clears throat> both beards. So they're, they're attracted <clears throat> You land, you're in the grotto, you're surrounded by all these, these just people that are fawning over you and trying to get to you and giving the evil eye to your wife. And you turn to her and you say, honey, I love you so much, I would not even think of cheating on you. And you actually remain faithful while surrounded by temptation. Then your love is of infinite more value. Your love is actually having an ability 
to be lived out. You can choose not to, and that makes it that much better. It makes the relationship genuine. The ability to love has to entail the ability to not love. Doesn't mean you have to not love in order to love. It means you have to have the ability to not love in order for your love to be genuine. And God in Scripture wanted a genuine love. He wanted a real love, and that involved God taking what to us would look like a risk by creating people and creation who could choose to turn away from him. And unlike the stupid playboy analogy, God didn't even put people in the midst of temptation. He put them in the midst of abundance and put one thing of temptation in there, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Just one. Everything else was amazing. So God didn't even stack the deck against them. He just, he, but there had to be that ability to disobey him in order for their obedience to mean anything, both to him and to them. That's what we see in Scripture, the integrity of the offer. If God offers salvation, if God gives the gospel, if, if it's already determined and decreed that you're going to accept it or reject it, then every Calvinist preacher is preaching an offer that they don't genuinely mean. Now, what I mean by that, they do mean, they want people to be saved because they don't know who the elect are. So they're genuinely hoping that all of the people in the audience are part of that elect decreed from all eternity and will respond to the irresistible grace that God offers through their preaching. And that's why guys like Piper and Packer and others are are staunchly devoted to missions and evangelism. So it's it's a myth that Calvinists don't do evangelism because God already declared. No, that's an Arminian caricature of Calvinism. True Calvinists are consistent in their desire for evangelism, but their desire is better than their theology, I would say. A theology that preaches salvation has to be a genuine offer. Paul quotes Isaiah uh, 65, and Paul's applying it to his setting in Romans. Isaiah boldly says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. But concerning Israel, he says, all day long, I've held out my hands to a disobedient and an obstinate people. That's the image that I see of God. All day long, I've held out my hands to people who I know are disobedient, and I know they're obstinate. He's talking about Israel in the Old Testament. I know that they're not going to accept it, but I'm still holding out the offer so that no one can say on the day of judgment, well, I couldn't have accepted it because I was reprobate. You didn't decree it, so it's not my fault. The offer is genuine, and I think that irresistible grace undermines that but rather what we see is an integrity of the offer. What about John when he says, no one can come to me unless the Father drags him and draws him? Well, in John, six chapters later, Jesus says, when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to myself. Same verb. Same verb, helkua or helko. I don't know a Calvinist that says, yeah, draw means drag. And so Jesus is saying he's going to drag all people to himself. So when he's lifted up, everyone's going to get saved. Everyone's going to believe. Well, no, the reprobate aren't in their system of theology. So how can it mean drag in one sense, but just draw or woo or offer in the other sense? The word can mean drag, compel, or it can mean attract or call. It's, a, it's, not, a, it's not a grab you and pull you. It's a, my hands are open. I'm drawing you. I'm telling you. I'm doing everything I want you to come. I'm motioning. I've got the airport lights. Back up the truck. You know, come on in. I'm doing all this thing. So there's a drawing. And nobody can choose to be saved on their own because Jesus had to initiate the offer. Israel couldn't have chosen to leave Egypt until God turned nature on its head and allowed for Israel to come out. So yes, salvation does come from God entirely, But the reception, the receiving of that salvation, the actualization of that salvation comes from humanity genuinely accepting a real offer. It's not a sham. It's not a show. So the last one, P, present assurance. I don't think the Bible teaches what we would call perseverance of the saints in the Calvinist sense. And I certainly don't think it teaches once saved, always saved. What we see in Scripture is Colossians 1. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel. Back up 22. To present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. In Romans 8, he'll say there's no condemnation. For who? For those who are in Christ. But that is absolutely contingent 
on our involvement. Because look at the next word in 23, if. It's a conditional. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel, this is the gospel that you heard and has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven in which I, Paul, have become a servant. God will keep you free from accusation. You can be assured of your salvation in the present. If you continue in your faith, your salvation is assured. If you think I've lost my salvation, your salvation is not car keys. You don't just lose it. It's not something you, whoops, I dropped my assurance. I dropped my salvation. I dropped my atonement. It's not like that. It's a relationship. And relationships can be walked away from. There's nowhere in Scripture that demands that Christians have to have this assurance of future salvation apart from their actions. It's always in contingency with their actions. It's always you're judged by your faith and your deeds together because you're judged according to who you are in the moment, who you are as you stand before God. The past doesn't exist anymore. The future doesn't exist at all yet. All you have is the present. So you can know, am I saved? Well, easy to answer. Are you in Jesus? If you're in Jesus, then you're saved. Are you not in Jesus? Are you living in sin right now? Are you kind of, well, like Jesus, but also like, you? well, then Scripture does allow for you some doubt of your salvation. I don't think there's anything wrong with that personally. Some people are like, I don't want somebody to doubt their salvation. I do, if they're not really saved. I absolutely want somebody to doubt their salvation if they just were raised Christian and think that they're saved because they said a prayer at a youth camp. Absolutely I want them to doubt that salvation. And there's nothing wrong with saying that. Now, do I want a Christian who's living their life and struggling and dealing with anxiety and depression and the tiniest little thing causes them to downward spiral into the depths of, I'm not even a Christian anymore. And I'm not even, that's a different thing. That's a pastoral issue. But theologically, you can say to that person, do you trust Jesus for your salvation? Have you put your faith in him? Have you believed the gospel right now? Not in the past, but right now, do you believe the gospel? Is Jesus your Lord? Did God raise him from the dead? And if they say yes, if that's the, then yes, you're in him. Are you in Jesus? The boat's going to reach the shore. Stay on the boat. Have you jumped ship yet? Have you definitively declared, I'm done with you, Jesus, I'm walking away? If that's the case, then yeah, there may be some reason to doubt your salvation, and you may need to turn back to God with fear and trembling. But unless you've done that, relax. You're on the boat, it's going to reach the shore. But you have to stay on the boat. So you can have present assurance. You can be eternally secure only when you're secure in eternity. Witherington says that. You you can know that you're going to be saved in the future when you get there. Right now, you can know you're going to be saved if you continue in how you are right now. Because think about this. If Calvinism's true, no one in here can have assurance of your salvation. None of you can be assured of your salvation if Calvinism's true. The reason is because in 10 years, if you walk away from the faith... And at lunch, Clay and I were talking about this, people I interned with, students we had in our groups who have definitively walked away from the faith, people that I knew, weddings that were done in this chapel, people who were interning and all of this stuff. And then after years, they actually they just left and they said, I'm done with it. I reject, I, this is I, this is just a phase in college, whatever. That means that they were, if Calvinism is true, they were never Christians to begin with. All the people they prayed for at this altar, all the work they did on campus, all the relationships they had with the Lord and their devotionals and all of it was a sham that they absolutely believed at the time. But in reality, if Calvin's true, they were never saved. So therefore, you, none of you can know if you're saved now because if 10 years from now you turn away, that means that right now you aren't saved. You just think you are. You're believing something, but it's not true. That's what Calvinism forces you to. And actually, Reformed theologians who are consistent, they'll, they'll say, yeah, we can't have assurance. We can hope that we're part of the elect. But I could be part of the reprobate. If 15 years from now I turn away from the Lord, it means that I'm reprobate. So that's what Calvinism forces you into, whereas non-Calvinist theologies can say, no, you can have assurance at every moment. Wesley was adamant. You can have assurance of your salvation. Are you in Christ? Are you filled with the Spirit right now? So Paul, 1 Thessalonians, for this reason, when I could stand it no longer, I sent to find out about your faith. I was afraid that in some way the tempter might have tempted you and our efforts might have been useless. How could Paul's efforts be useless if the uh, elect will always be saved and the reprobate will always be damned? Why does Paul even worry about their spiritual fate? 
Nothing he can do will change the fixed number of the elect from the beginning of time. But yet you see in his letters, he does worry. He does think that this might be in vain. He tells Timothy, my son, I give you this instruction in keeping with the prophecies once made about you so that by following them, you may fight the good fight, holding on to a faith and a good conscience. Some have rejected these and so have shipwrecked their faith. Among them are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I've handed over to Satan to be taught not to blaspheme. You can make a shipwreck of your faith and be handed over to Satan. And Paul expresses in the, in the Corinthians letters that the purpose in handing someone over to Satan is so that they will repent and return to Jesus by seeing what Satan has to offer and seeing the community of the church and realizing I don't have that anymore because I left it. I need to return. That's the purpose of handing someone over to Satan. That's what you do to an apostate in the early church. But if that's not even possible to turn away, then this is a lot of wasted ink at a time when ink was really expensive. So Philippians, in all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel. From the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a work, and it doesn't say in you in Greek. It says, and who men, in or among y'all. It's a plural. It's not saying God who began a good work in your heart will make sure that that is finished and so nothing you do can ever mess that up. Whether that's true or not, this passage isn't saying it. This passage is saying, God who began a good work among y'all Philippians, I'm convinced he's going to see it to completion. He did see it to completion because the church exploded and magnified, it grew, it spread all over the world, and we're here today. Here's the thing to, to notice. We'll end it here. Jerry Walls, he says, notice that both Calvinist and free will theologians ultimately arrive at a point where further explanations are impossible. Both reach the limit of finally inexplicable choice. The free will theologian cannot fully explain why some choose Christ while others do not. I can't explain why I follow Jesus and good people who I know that don't. I don't know what it is that's preventing them within them from choosing that. I don't know why they don't. And because I don't know, I can pray very Calvinist-sounding prayers. God, open their eyes of their heart. Soften their heart. Lead them to you. Draw them to you. I, all those prayers that I want, and I can live with the fact that I, at the end of the day, I can't explain why somebody accepts and somebody doesn't. Because I'm okay with that rather than saying, well, I can explain that. It's because God chose from the foundation of the world to create some people to send explicitly to hell and some people to bring to heaven. That's not an answer that makes sense to me. And Scripture doesn't demand that I accept that answer, so I'm not accepting it. Because Calvinism and a desire to uplift God's glory actually removes God's love. Because what you have is a God who created billions of people specifically to not be saved. He created them specifically for Him to pass over in order to save the rest. So no parent who has a bunch of children who all have a disease and has a cure and gives the cure to five or six of the children and leaves 15 or 20 of them to die, that's not love. That's evil. Why? Shouldn't the people that he got the medicine, shouldn't they be grateful that he saved some of them? No, not if he can save all of them. So when people talk, when Calvinists, they say, well, we should be grateful that God saves anybody because all of us deserve wrath and death. And the fact that God saves the elect is, displays his mercy no, it doesn't. It displays his arbitrariness. And it displays the fact that he could have saved everyone. If it doesn't have anything to do with their response, then God could have saved everyone and chose not to save some. And that's the mystery that Calvinists have to live with. The Calvinists cannot tell us why or on what basis God chooses some for salvation and passes others by. That's the God that Calvinism leaves with us, whether we like it or not, whether good Calvinists try to get around that or not, or try to soften it. You know, John Piper speaks about it in different ways, but at the end of the day, that's what he's saying. That's the choice that Calvinists get to, that they say, well, it's, we just can't know that. It's the inscrutable will of God. Non-Calvinists say, when it comes to why, who freely accepts and who rejects, I don't know. But I'm not willing to say it's because God created my dead grandfather who didn't receive the gospel, which I'm just making this up, my grandfather was, but God created them specifically to be damned for his glory? How does that work? What kind of glory is that? What kind of love is that? Well, it's God's love. It's different than our love. Yeah, but how different? Because that's not even remotely like our love. 
I mean, there's not even a human analogy that we can, and if, and if God's love is so different from what we think of as love, why do you think God's sovereignty is what we think sovereignty should be? And why do you think God's trustworthiness is actually what we think of when we say that something's trustworthy? If God's love is different than anything we experience, and he can create people specifically to damn them for all eternity, then why, how can we trust any other attribute of his to be anything like what we think it should be? So what Calvinism does is it leaves you with some hard choices. Now, some Christians, many Christians are willing to make that choice because they, they are convinced and, and Calvinism offers this system of theology that's logical and it's sound. And man, you can hear some people really present a compelling case for it. And they do. And you should read Calvinists and hear what they're saying. But you shouldn't do what the interns right after I did did and only read Calvinists and think, well, this is theology. And what you're doing is folk religion or man-made, human-centered thinking. Because that's just not true at all. <clears throat> Here are a couple of resources if you ever want to look into this. Austin Fisher's book, I've mentioned it, Young Restless No Longer Reformed. Roger Olson has two books, Against Calvinism and Arminian Theology, Myths and Reality. Ben Wetherington at Asbury has the problem with evangelical theology, examining the foundations of Calvinism, dispensationalism, and Wesleyanism. He actually questions some things about Wesleyanism, which is cool to see a Methodist do. Excellent chapter on Calvinism. And then his theology, his, his commentary on Romans, Paul's letter to the Romans, the socio-rhetorical commentary. It's fantastic. And he looks at how these views of predestination and election and all of this stuff developed over the years as he goes through Romans. And then the last one, I don't have a copy with me, but a book by Greg, that Greg Boyd edited called Across the Spectrum. And I think the subtitle is like Examining Doctrines that Divide Christians or something like that. Across the Spectrum. What it does is it takes all of these doctrines, predestination, free will, baptism, um, you know, women in ministry, all of these issues where Christians differ. And it allows Christians from those views to express their view fairly and accurately. So you can get a sample from things across the spectrum. To me, that's the best way to learn theology. Learn it in discussion. Learn it in dialogue with people who believe it rather than just reading caricatures of what other people say. So definitely don't take what I said today as, oh, well, that's Calvinism. I've tried to distill as best I can from a non-Calvinist a fair and accurate depiction of Calvinism, but I know I failed. I know that if a Calvinist were sitting here, they'd go, yeah, but you left out this, you downplayed this, you didn't... Fine, go read their stuff. Go explore, go learn, grow, because that's what you're in right now. You're in the season of growing and having your faith refined and tested. And the last thing you need to do is say, well, we haven't figured it out yet, so it doesn't matter. It absolutely matters. Can you pray to a God who is determined from all eternity that the person that you love more than anyone who's not a Christian will never be a Christian no matter what they do because he created them specifically to send them to hell where they'll suffer consciously for all eternity. Can you serve a God like that? If you can, so be it. More power to you. I know plenty of people that can, but I can't. Know what you believe, chew on it, marinate, grow, and um, we're out of time. Again, this is not meant to disparage anyone who is a Calvinist, but it is meant to challenge what I think are the shortcomings of Calvinism and to explain why I'm not one. Feel free to leave your comments in the comment section below. And if you haven't done so already, I would really appreciate it if you subscribe to this channel and help us to continue to grow this ministry. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time back here at Disciple Dojo.